in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. I remember somebody saying once that there is philosophical significance in the fact that you will never see the back of your own head. Of course, you'll see a picture of it, and when you go to the hairdresser, they'll probably hold up one of those mirrors afterwards so that you can see how your hair looks. But you'll never be able to stand and gaze at the back of your head without some kind of mediation. And this feels like a very peculiar idea until you realize that you'll never be able to see the front of your head without some kind of mediation either, whether photograph or mirror or description. And this leads to a rather striking conclusion, which is that the way in which the entire rest of the world sees you is not something which is accessible to you. The way that the entire rest of the world sees you is not something accessible to you. In the epistle of James this morning, verse 23, the writer says that the person who hears the word of God but does not do it is like a person who looks at himself, at his natural face, in a mirror, but then goes away and immediately forgets what manner of man he was. What struck me about this sentence was that it implies that we can know something about our true selves, our manner, by looking into a mirror. And that's certainly at odds with my own experience. One of the things that I have found most uncomfortable over the past couple of months is the almost daily agony of having to stare at my face for prolonged periods of time on a computer screen. And the challenge is not only related to my own obvious shortcomings in the handsomeness department, but more fundamentally, the challenge is that I feel entirely detached from the image which purports to be me. A face certainly stares back at me and it copies what I do, but I feel bears no relation to the complexity and turmoil within me. And so with apologies to the writer of James, I rejoice when I leave that apparition behind because I'm confident that he bears only a superficial resemblance to who and what I am. And against that background, we can draw much comfort from the words of Jesus in John's Gospel today. As Jesus prepares to be separated from his disciples by arrest and death, he assures them of a coming time when he will be united with them as they have never been united before. The disciples rejoice to hear Jesus say that the age of Proverbs, what you might call the age of analogy, is coming to an end. The disciples certainly had struggled to pick up their meaning and had pestered Jesus during his ministry for plain speaking, like dull and unambitious schoolboys. But I wonder if the disciples really clocked the important point that Jesus would soon show them plainly of the Father and the disciples would no longer pray through Christ but rather directly to the one who sent him. So Jesus here in this reading announces the coming end of the age of mediation. And he proclaims to those who will hear him that a time is coming when the mysteries, the obfuscations, the frustrations of this world will pass away and we will know God as we have never known him before. But there's another aspect to this new kind of knowledge. Because in knowing God as he is, it's offered to us to know ourselves as we are, our true identities lying as they do in communion with him. And this is very important in the present day. It seems to me that the general bewilderment of our age stems from being separated from all the comfortable certainties by which we like to live, or at least assumed certainties. I consider that what many people have found recently is that they aren't really certain about anything and they aren't sure that they were ever entitled to be certain about anything. So I've reflected on the passage from James and I've concluded that what makes me feel uncomfortable in staring at myself on Zoom is not just that my hair looks odd or my nose bigger than I'd always assumed it to be. Seeing myself on the screen makes me realise that I'm not really sure who I am. I said earlier on in this sermon that I could dismiss this apparition on Zoom as not really reflecting the real me. But perhaps what makes me uncomfortable is the sense that the apparition does tell me something about who I am, albeit something that I'm not familiar with. Maybe, and in fact, I'm increasingly sure, 
there are truths about me to which I am not privy. I might get glimpses of them in my internal experience. I might get broken reflections of them as I look in the world around, or I might never encounter them at all. But there are mysteries out there about me which are waiting to be discovered. Now all this could drive us mad if it were our eternal lot, but I'm confident that it isn't. In the farewell discourses in John, Jesus promises that we will be drawn into the divine dance of Father, Son and Spirit. And in being drawn in in that way, we will know ourselves because we know the one who knows us completely, the one who is knowledge itself. Truth isn't something which is exterior to that relationship, but is essential to it. So our vocation in the present, in this bizarre period of time, is to continue to feel our way toward that communion and to find out what we can about ourselves and about God in relationship with each other, but never to be despondent at our own self-mystery. This is especially true now when so many of us are isolated and are being forced to confront our own depths, our own mysteries and uncertainties in a way we might normally like to skate over. Our calling then is to have faith in the one who draws us in, to knowledge of him and to knowledge of our true selves. Amen.